So I'm walking around with W.C. Fields, and a guy yells at me, Hey, Mr. Director, put my wife in your next film. And just off the top of my head, Sorry, sir, it's not a monster movie. The enemy had no power on your mother sucks cocks in hell. Hey, Brian Lally here, Hollywood native, and you're about to watch another episode of Brian Lally, Hollywood native. I'm sitting here with my partner in crime, as always, the man who put it all together, my friend, Scott Williams. Scott, how are you? I'm doing great, Brian. How are you? I am fantastic. Never better. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Uh, oh, who do we have on the show tonight? I forgot what I was doing. <laughs> Today, Brian, we have a great guest, James Collins. Jim is from a small town in Illinois, right on the Mississippi River, and he spent a lot of time playing on that river, which I think is pretty cool. Jim is one of 15 children, and out of those 15 children, he's the only one that came out to Los Angeles, moved out with his good friend Randy in a van in the 1970s to be in a band. He's a musician. He's a singer-songwriter. He's an actor, and he acts in all sorts of media, which I find really interesting. The guy is never without a job. So stick around. You're going to hear this story from Jim himself, and I know you'll enjoy it. Southern Illinois, is that where you were born? Southern Illinois, historic river town called Alton, which is right on the Mississippi River. Wow. And really an interesting, quirky place. One of the most haunted cities in the United States. Nice. I was a kid. I was the oldest of 15 children, family that had You 15. were the oldest of 15. Oh, you did a lot of babysitting at a very young age. Oh, no. No. They no. wouldn't trust me with their other children. <laughs> no. I knew where the gasoline matches were. No. I would say that we had traditional roles. Right. And there was me, and then there were like four girls. Right. Right away. So they, or maybe it was only three. And... The girls took over the the child supervision mm -hmm. kind of things. Right. Yeah. Do you know all the, your siblings' names? Oh, sure. <laughs> you want to hear them? Yes. All right. Here we go. Right. In uh, order. You? In order. That's the only way you can memorize them. <laughs> Just tack on one a year. So my name is Jim. Right. Uh, Jim, Deanne, Janet, Linda, Mike, Karen, Jeannie, Joe, Patty, Susie, Tommy, Timmy, and Beth, my parents lost a couple of little boys along the way. Their names were Johnny and Danny. Do you know all their names? Do I? Yeah, they're my brothers. What are they called? Maki, Ricky, Danny, Terry, Mikey, Davey, Timmy, Tommy, Joey, Robbie, Johnny, and Brian. And if you're counting along at home, that's 15. Wow. So there was 17 total? No, there was 15 total. Oh, but two of... Uh, but two passed away. 13 lived to adulthood. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, That's between sad. two people, no blended families or anything like that. There were some Irish names in there. There was something going on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How many Irish twins? All of them? No. All um, of them I, were nine months apart? I know what an Irish twin is. I believe all of them are nine months apart. Yeah. There might be some. That, so, yeah. so it's 15 yeah, Irish twins. Yeah, some might have been a photo finish. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But all of them still live in that area. I'm the only one that kind of spun out into space. Really? And went somewhere else. Wow. Yeah. What is the population of the town? Do you know? Well, I don't know what it is now. When I was there, it was about 60,000. 60,000. Okay. 60,000. A suburb of St. Louis. Okay. But it was about 25 miles away, across two rivers. Right. So it's in southern Illinois. Now, the Mississippi is a pretty strong flowing river, right? Absolutely. Any of your friends jump in and... Drink? I haven't talked to any, all of them recently, but... Well, I met his children, but not as, you know, oh, not as Oh, did we go swimming in the Mississippi River? Yeah. There were a lot of friends of mine whose parents had cabins on the river. Right. Or boats were very common. Right. Southern California, everybody has a pool. Right. And out there, there's a lot of boats, a lot of jet skis, aquatic kind of thing so yeah we played in the river yeah yeah there was a lot of that going nobody on. got towed off nobody got towed off nobody got towed off did a lot of fishing in that river wow yeah wow real huck finn kind of yeah kinda it, it seemed like it you could you could compare it to that grew up there uh very early on i had a few teachers who were really instrumental in kind of steering me towards the drama club right. and all that i was a fair athlete and i was not going to get any better at that so I was looking for the thing that I could do. Mm -hmm. And when I got involved in 
the plays at the junior high into the high school, okay, that, that appealed to my skill set. Right. You know, and so I got involved with that, rode that pony all the way through high school. Right. Doing everything I could. Started studying it in college and got clued in pretty quick to the fact that, I, you know, this is going to take me to a teaching degree, which might be fine. Right. But I think I want to do this. Right. I think I want to do this. Moved to L.A., was here uh, with a couple of friends. Did you go to college? Went to college, uh, partial college. Yeah. Par partial college. Dropped out and said, okay, this is taking me nowhere. I'm going to Los Angeles. Well, did you go there to study drama or? Went there as a theater major. Right. Yes. And um, did a few things there. Learned a lot. It was a good transitional period between high school. And yeah. That. I just want to point out that David said he was two minutes away <laughs> ten minutes ago. <laughs> go ahead. So, <laughs> Well, there you go. Moved out here. Was here about six months. Right. Was doing, a, a, got hooked up with an extra casting service. Right. And I did a couple of films. One of them was Rocky II. Oh, wow. And another one was Golden Girl. Wow. James Coburn and... Um, that beautiful blonde lady who I don't remember her name now. Farrah Fawcett? No, not that beautiful Lonnie blonde Anderson. lady. Another one. The, the <laughs> California girl who was Miss California. Uh, Golden Girl. Look it up. Okay. But Sorry, I'm late. That's all right. Hey, how, how, I'm Jim. Nice to meet you. David was two minutes away ten minutes ago. <laughs> well, he's here now. You're, uh, em, you're going to tell me the truth when it's all over. Yeah. yeah. So... All right. We're good. We're so, here. How you doing? I'm good, man. How good. are you? Good. Good to see you. He was talking about his, not a small town, 60,000, but coming up and smaller now. drama. Yeah. But also he mentioned that he was one of 15 children. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Dang. Yeah. They had their own basketball team. So, <laughs> Golden Girl, we yeah. just spoke of that. Susan Anton was in it. Oh, okay. That's the way, that, was, that was the name. Right. Did that for a little while. Then my roommates are like, we're leaving. California's too much. The band broke up. We're going back home. I moved out here with a couple of... And Randy also? Gotcha. Or no, Randy... No, that was a different time. Different oh, okay. band. Oh, okay. So I moved back. Got an oh, agent. you moved back. I moved oh, back okay. with them. I'm right. not staying out here by right. myself. But I got an agent in St. Louis. Okay. First audition they sent me on was for the mascot of the St. Louis Baseball Cardinals. Right. You know, <laughs> went, did that, got the job. Did that for a couple of seasons. That was a hoot in itself. And then uh, packed up again, came to L.A. This is almost like Garth Brooks. Did he do that? Well, he was he, a mascot. He, no, he went, but he went to Nashville, then to make it, got scared, and came back. Yeah. Not saying you were scared. He was right? only there for like 24 hours, though. Or something. Oh, was that what it was? Yeah. Okay. Well, see, you're a product of Hollywood. You didn't have to leave. You were here regardless. I, I, yeah, well, let me tell you. <laughs> I should have left. Yeah. I did move to Canada in 1983 because I had worn out my welcome in Los Angeles. So let me tell you that much. Okay. Anyway, so you moved out here again, and that was with Randy? Randy was part of that. Yeah. Randy's a buddy of In mine. In the same type of van that he has now, the same type. Yeah. You know about the van. Yeah, he told me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I ask questions. Re okay. <laughs> Nosy. Um, <laughs> Facts. Re Randy and I were good friends in high school, right. and then I talked him into coming to L.A. because back then, all my friends had to come to L.A. Right. I wasn't going to stay there. They had to follow me. Right. So we came out. We learned to surf and uh, explored the California lifestyle. Uh, booked the first three auditions I ever went on Bastards. in L.A. Bastards. And it didn't work for five years. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Feel bad now? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. You made some good money there in those first three. Yeah. Agent died. Kind of was without representation. Couldn't make the transition. So I went back to doing theater for about 11 or 12 years. And uh, had a lot of fun doing that. But I didn't. nobody comes to L.A. to do theater. Right. We're coming to LA for something else when I first started acting I was in a play every weekend for seven years oh my god how's that I well, love theater kept you out of trouble but I didn't come to LA to do theater <laughs> you were installed <laughs> I <that>. was here <laughs> <laughs> I get it well let me ask you how'd you end up in Orange County Orange County one of the other buddies that I moved out here with knew one girl <laughs> who lived in California in Orange County she had moved down here with her family so I'm like all right that gives us a a destination right so we come out here she happened to be an actress oh and i want to be an actor i'm interested in you and and so we became friends the the next day after i moved here she said i have an audition come up and we'll stop by my agent's office we'll introduce you so i met the agent 
got sent on an audition, got that, got my card, and um, had a job, an agent and a job within two weeks. And that was great. I was like, this is easy. Yeah. What are they talking about, right? <laughs> and then everything kind of changed quickly, as things will. Um, at the time, I had a job doing singing telegrams all over Orange County. <laughs> I was a singing telegram performer, number one in Orange County for about five years. Wow. Yeah. Numero that, uno. Well, yeah, I was the brokest singing telegram <laughs> performer. That was made me hungry. Yeah. But we did that all over town, and that was great training. I needed to do that, to just sort of loosen up and figure out how to walk into a room and capture the room for right. about three to five minutes and then get out right. with everything, including right. my life. Yeah. So I did the sing and telegram thing, and uh, then um, worked a number of you know survival-type jobs. Ended up being a Beetlejuice at Universal Studios. Did nice. that for about 10 years. And it was Santa Claus at Disneyland and all kinds of things. I used to love that Beetlejuice. It oh. was a full-on show? Well, the Beetlejuice show was there. Okay. But in addition to the Beetlejuice actors on, on stage, there were the guys that were in the trenches, like the street Beetlejuice, <laughs> oh, okay. the guy that's walking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Beetlejuice was the perfect character because you're in a theme park and theme parks you have to really watch what you say and what you do you have to be good judgment unless you're beetlejuice yeah. which everybody expects to be rude oh, yeah. and and weird so that was a very cool thing it was a very cool thing i did about eight or ten different characters for them came back I finally got a new agent and then i started to work and which was great because it, it only took me like 25 years to get to the point of doing what i came out here to do did a lot of stuff. I've been so fortunate along the way. I've got a great agent in Hugh Leon and Coast to Coast. Shout out to Coast to Coast. Hugh Leon? Did we talk about this already? Do you know Hugh? Yeah. I mean, he doesn't know me, but he was good friends with a buddy of mine, Walker Yule. I think he was friends. And I met him over the years many times. And my son was with Coast to Coast commercially 20 five years ago, as a kid two years ago yeah they do very well coast to coast yeah. is a great agency and i can't say enough about hugh he changed yeah. my life dude he's been around forever he's obviously pretty good because he's been handling people forever well it's only because he started as a very young man hugh yeah. you're not that old but <laughs> well forever i mean six, six. <laughs> i know exactly it's hollywood what you forever mean. everybody I, leaves he's after very two, lauded after three agent. years yeah i got it so Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And yeah. it's right up on Barham, so you don't have... Are they still right there on Barham? They're still right there at yeah. the top of Barham. You could walk there if you need I to did. go. Yeah. I did. I have quite a few times. Yeah. So... But, yeah, I did that. I've just been been very lucky. It's all, it's all been a weird adventure. Right. Did you study acting anywhere? Yeah. I studied in college. Right. But when you came to town, you... Oh, when I came to town? Yeah. I've been to workshops and different things along the way. Uh, I did so much theater along the way that right. always felt like I've approached every job that I've done from the perspective of a, like an actor. Right. You know, if I'm driving a taxi or being a Lyft driver, I'm just pretending that I'm an actor doing right. that. So everything is kind of informed and fed me that way. Right. So I have studied with South Coast Rep oh, okay. in Orange County. Oh, I have they, several friends who are acting rep. teachers. Yeah. Yeah. I've done picked up some other. Education. Ever do any groundlings or anything? Didn't do any groundlings. Any Didn't type do... of improv? Because you talk about doing a lot of improv. I have picked up a lot of improv. Most of that started occurring at Universal. Okay. Because I'm walking around as Beetlejuice or a movie director or whatever I'm doing that day, and I'm encountering hundreds and maybe a couple thousand people throughout the day. You got to have something to say to them. Right. And. I always had kind of a smart mouth anyway, but once I realized, oh, I can do this, and I'm sort of naturally bent towards uh, having the funny thing to say, that helped me a lot. So that helped the improv thing. Right. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, that had to be a blast, walking around, roasting people as Beetlejuice. Uh, that, was, awesome. that was really groovy. Yeah. And unlike some of the other characters, which are more storybook characters, mm -hmm. and which had to, like, be... You know, yeah, very. Yeah, uh, Princess Midnight yeah. or whoever they are. Yeah, Beetlejuice had to be freeing for sure. Yeah, they That's need awesome. to make a sequel to Beetlejuice oh, yeah. for the, you know, this century. Mm -hmm. They really need yeah, to do that. Definitely. Yeah. Heck yeah. Well, how was it being in that outfit 
and universal in the summer. Absolutely horrible. Yeah. I would leave, I would shower, I'd come to work, and then I'd had about, and I'm not great with makeup. I looked like Beetlejuice had been homeless for a while and <laughs> in the street, but you had to glue on the full clown cap, right? and then you have all the white, then you have graveyard moth. Uh, right. You gl put glue on it, then you throw moss on your face to make it look. It was a full, complete clown makeup. Yeah. And that was tough. That was challenging. And, and But they put it on, or did you have to put it no, on? No, they show you how to put it on. Really? Yes, and then you get one or two lessons, and then you're left oh, to your own bullshit. device. Oh, that's bullshit. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It, but, you know, I mean, we're used to... When you're working on a, on a show mm -hmm. or something, you go, they have a makeup person. They do all that stuff for you. Mm -hmm. No, Universal is more of a day-to-day -day operation. I got to tell you, I was mentioned on the way out here that I was in the Lost World Jurassic Park, and we filmed on the Universal lot, and the tram came by. I was no kid when that was going on, you know what I mean? I can't tell you how excited I was for the tram to be there talking about us, talking about the new Steven Spielberg movie. You know, and I'm sitting there like I'm 10 years old looking at because it's, you know, the Universal Tram is famous. Now, you started you know? at Universal what year? I didn't start there. I was just in the... Okay, the, the, but you were filming there. At 97. 97. Yeah. I started in 96 because well, they had just opened up the Universal Jurassic Park ride. Oh, okay. Now, I, you know, I got a story about that. I was right. very That's new. what we're here for. Oh, well, lucky I got one. <laughs> I was about two weeks in to the job, and right. I really needed the job. I needed it to work. And I'm walking around as a Hollywood movie director. Right. And they pair me up with W.C. Fields. Right. And they come up and they say, okay, guys, we're shutting down the ride in five minutes due to mechanical operation. Some of these people have been in line for three hours. Go out there and entertain them. Okay. Oh, yeah, yes. that sounds like a suicide mission. Right. right. <laughs> so I'm walking around with W.C. Fields. And a guy yells at me, hey, Mr. Director, put my wife in your next film. And just off the top of my head, sorry, sir, it's not a monster movie. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> 40 or 50 people loved that joke. Right. But there were two people that did not. And those were the only two people I could focus on because right. both of their faces just fell. Yeah. And I'm like, I felt so bad about that. Because it was true. Well, it, no. it was, I didn't even think about that. They were quite perfectly fine, but I needed something to say, and I just reached out for that. Right. And I walked back. I said, oh, I feel so bad. And the W.C. Field guy, great, talented guy, looks at me. He goes, you're not really a director either. <laughs> <laughs> Man up. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. So kind of set a few boundaries there. Yeah. I needed those. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. No, that was before you were living... Where we're living, Jim is my next door neighbor. Yeah, but, keep the noise down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you signed with Hugh years ago. So you signed commercially. I signed because... with Coast to Coast in the early 2000s. Oh, okay. And they're keeping me around because I probably won't go away. So did you stop playing music? Were you still gigging or? Music. You've heard me play guitar. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Right. I've always been very fortunate that one of the, things I have in my actor's toolbox is that I sing pretty well. Mm -hmm. And that kept me working in different kind of musicals and Rodgers and Hammerstein and that sort of theater where some other non-singing actors may have had to go do something else. Right. I taught myself how to play guitar when I was in early high school and the singing thing was just something that kind of came naturally. And I've had some great music teachers along the way. Yeah. So that's where the music thing comes in for me oh okay yeah so anybody else out of the 17 people in the household anybody else talented they're talented in a variety of different ways i'm not going to say they, they may listen to this they're incredibly talented people <laughs> most of them uh, have their own children they pursued a more traditional family kind of life right. got married had offspring worked for local companies yeah. but there's a lot of really funny people 
in my family. Nothing like waiting for Guffman when the local people got together to do some wild show? A great movie that actually takes place in Missouri. Yeah. Nobody like that. I have a niece who was actively involved in theater for a while. I have right. a nephew who plays guitar. So it, Let me ask you this. Yeah. How many nieces and nephews do you have? Oh, it's incalculable. <laughs> you don't know their names. No, if I had an abacus, I couldn't figure that. Man, Brian, you know what I love doing? Yeah. I love tapping that subscribe button. Mmm. I love it too, son. And just like all your dates, I tap it last. But nothing's as good as tapping this button. You see Brian here? He's not always doing the best. Financially, mentally, physically, for sure. You want to help keep Brian off the streets of Hollywood? There's a way you can help. Join us on Patreon. You want to tell him what we got on there, buddy? Yes, we have the general admission, we have the backstage, and we have the VIP all-access pass. So please, join today. I'm due for a bath. In the arms of the <laughs> angel, it's somewhere between, I would say, 24 and 30. Right. Something like that. Yeah. There's a few of us that who've, I, I don't have any children. There's a few siblings I have, which also decided not to have children. Right. Yeah. But it's a special club. I was telling you about my friend, Eric. I forget how many. I meant to call him just to ask him. There's 15, 17 kids in his family. But it's a, it's, a, it's a unique club because another part of our group, a woman who was like one of 14, and when they met up, it's almost like, uh, you know, there's an energy there. You're one of 14, I was one of 17, and it's a, right. it's a club. And the family reunions get absolutely nuts when right. you get something like that. Right. I mean, it's like, where are all of these people and who's married to who? Right. 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 And is there ever a screaming match? It's like, you broke my bicycle when I was... No. Yeah, there's some of that. <laughs> there's some of 45 that. 45 years ago. There's some of that, but they're in southern Illinois and I'm out here. Right. The next generation, my nieces and nephews, are having their own children. Mm -hmm. So now there's like toddlers walking around. I'm like, hey, who does this one belong to? Oh, right. okay, that belongs to, to them. All right. Yeah. And what are they related to me? I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. How big was the house you grew up in? It got bigger as the family got bigger. Did they add it on? They did add oh, on. Oh, okay. They did add on. What was the end result of bedrooms? <sighs> Let's see. When, when we moved in, I remember the day we moved into our family home, and we're all running through the house going, this is my room, this is my room. I had the bad luck of claiming my parents' room. It was the biggest. It was in the, this is where I belong. <laughs> this is mine. And everybody claimed all the other rooms. And uh, which room did you take? This one. That's where Dad and I sleep. Oh, no. So I was homeless within my own home. <laughs> but they fixed up a nice room for me. I was the oldest boy, so I lived in the basement like a troll. Right. Yeah. Well, but it's the Midwest. It was the size of the home a lot of times. The basement was... Basements aren't I really mean, common square footage. in Southern California. No, no. Everybody has basements. We there. grew up with a very small basement, but I have family in Massachusetts, and, and I've seen basements that are the size of, uh, as you know, square footage of the ground floor of the home. It might be... Thousand square foot basement or right. fifteen hundred square foot, and th basement. there are reasons for that in yeah. other places like Illinois or Massachusetts or older communities, and that was where people would seek shelter during a tornado. Right, right, because right. They, and it's also where they kept the crop. It was the pickle basement. You know, I did they not, do all the canning. I that. did not know that it was refrigeration. It was right. easier to yeah. keep the basement natural cool. refrigeration. Ex exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Though most of the crops in the world come from California. All the we, good ones. We, we did All not, the good ones. We did not have, in Los Angeles, we did not have that. Because I'm from Los Angeles. I don't know if that's come up before. But. <laughs> yes, once or twice. <laughs> Hollywood native. <laughs> Hollywood um, native. So did you, you live in the basement by yourself? At my parents' house? Yeah. I had my own room. There, okay. And that was great. I don't know if that was to keep me out of trouble or it was a gift. Mm -hmm. But when I moved out, my next brother got it. And then the, that that room was sort of the legacy of the next gotcha. of the next boy nice. coming along because most of the boys in my family are about five years apart right you know so 
Yeah. Were you always entertaining back then or trying to be the, I thought the, center, so. of, <laughs> the center of attention? I certainly thought so. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, like an actor. I, I, <laughs> I was sort of an unruly kid. You know, I, like I had kind of a smart mouth, and that got me into trouble quite a bit. As I got older and started doing plays in school, I, I remember walking around going, yes, I'm an actor. Oh, mm-hmm. where do you work? Well, I don't have a job. I'm an actor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I remember with my little brothers and sisters, we'd be watching like reruns of Gilligan's Island. And I'm like, someday I'm going to have my own porthole. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to see my face on there. Thought, of course, I thought it would still be running. Right. You know, yeah, but right. I, I never got that. It ran for quite some time. Yes, it did. It did. Have Pete, they tried to remake that in any way? I uh, know. I'm sorry they haven't. But I, I, you know, with GPS, they might not. They might be able to find the island. Didn't they make a remake of that? I'm I, not sure. I'm they... thinking Tom Arnold was the skipper. They did like a movie. Oh, okay. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm gonna block that out. Well, they certainly did return to Gilligan's Island. They did. They did they have movies did like that. But I didn't of know. Gilligan's Island. With, yeah. Uh, yeah. Scott's gonna find our our Gilligan's Island rescue from Gilligan's Island. The Harlem Globetrotters visit Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Harold Hecuba visits Gilligan Phil Silvers. I ask to be or not to be. That is the question yes. that I ask of thee. Yeah, look at you. Yeah, everybody shows up. Hey, you know, we watch TV. My dad used to play golf with Alan Hale, the skipper. So I got to meet a lot of people when I was young at golf tournaments and stuff. So Yeah, with, uh, uh, with all these streaming services, you would think that they're... <clears throat> They'd be trying to work something on remaking this, but we know how that usually goes. Yeah. Well, it usually goes bad, but they still try to make it. Rescue from Gilligan's Island, 78. Probably the return to Gilligan's Island was Some, on there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Beneath planet of Gilligan's Island. <laughs> Were you a ginger or Marianne? Oh, I would have to say Marianne. <laughs> Me too. I was Marianne all the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Ginger, yeah. If, at that point, if I would have met a woman like Ginger, I would have just fainted or something. Marianne seemed attainable. Well, she was from the Midwest <laughs> like I was. That's we had something were, to talk you about. You were from Southern Illinois. We had Gingers walking around all over Los yeah, Angeles well, so, at right. all times. You're from Hollywood, so, aren't you? I was, went to Hollywood High School. There's my picture up there on the wall. <laughs> so... You were telling me the other day uh, that you were you were teaching some sort of neuro something. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you. With COVID and everything that happened, mm-hmm. you know, nobody's going to work. There's no auditions. There's no tapings or anything. You still have to eat. Right. You still have to go out. So uh, f- fortunate enough to have a circle of acting friends who had these jobs, uh, working for um, a nonprofit organization that provides additional curriculum to somewhat distressed school students. If you have some gifted students who are in some sort of school that maybe just doesn't have the budget for arts or science Mm -hmm. or these programs, they will hire other teachers to come in and provide the additional curriculum. Mm -hmm. In order to keep that interesting, a lot of the people who do that are actors. Right. Because you don't know from from day to day if you're going to be teaching forensics or dissecting a sheep's eye or maybe doing a module on Shakespeare. You had to kind of like get the information, absorb the information, and then relate the information to the students. Right. And that's when I realized that actors are all teachers and all teachers are actors. And I'm not saying that all teachers are great actors, but the best teachers I've had have been the ones that could be great actors. It's the same thing. You've got this information, you're giving it back to someone in an entertaining form and teaching some of the most rewarding stuff I've ever done. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Did you have to get a degree for that? Not for this particular assignment. Mm -hmm. Because we're endorsed by L.A. Unified, but we're not employed by L.A. Unified. Another reason the children that come out of L.A. Unified uh, might be lacking a little bit. Well, They just get a few actors. It happens. It (laughs) it does. I was part of the L.A. Unified. I also went to private school. I, I went to a lot of different schools. But when I was in the third grade, they put my desk in the principal's office. So... That was part of my L.A. Unified. 
has let me sit there by my myself for a while because I too thought I was entertaining. Well, but of course you are, barely. They, <laughs> they thought I was not. I had a similar thing at a Daytona State College in Florida where I went to. Yeah, I was in the theater improv classes at the time, and they would pair us up with the paramedic students, and we'd come in with all these different yes. ailments and different things going on with us, and we'd have to fully act like we're in in the moment of that to fluster them a little bit or you, get them feeling. They still do that to this day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've, yeah. Standardized <laughs> medical testing is okay. what they call that. Yeah. And if you're an actor and you, you want to get part of this, well, go out and pretend that you're sick and you give your phony list of ailments to the doctor and they try to, you know, diagnose yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. See, you're ahead of your time yeah. there, brother. Yeah. <laughs> No, I have friends that have done that down at USC. Mm -hmm. They've gone down, and they pay pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't get paid, but it was well, good I, experience. <laughs> that's Florida. I don't know if I've told you, but I didn't come from Los Angeles. Yeah, so. yeah, they, ran, yeah. they ran the film industry out of Orlando a while ago. Yeah. Atlanta sucked it up. Yeah. I, uh, it's funny because someone's going to watch this and say, say, he just keeps mentioning Los Angeles as if it's serious. Do I mean, people watch podcasts? People watch this one. Oh, they if, watch it? Is there a camera somewhere? There may be six of them. Oh, okay. So <laughs> Scott kind of has his I own see. little... little. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you may be an actor. <laughs> so, yeah, I was curious to, you know, jobs that keep you going over the years. You've had many jobs. A lot uh, of them. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. My resume reads like a circus act right. i mean between national league mascots singing telegram performer beetlejuice um santa claus i was even the easter bunny earlier this year <laughs> were you sorry kids i don't want to give away any secrets wow. here. <laughs> but yeah whatever comes along i also work for a wonderful company and i should mention this their name is tribute productions tribute entertainment and it's ran by uh, Miss Bella, who we all know and love. She's the number one provider for look -al celebrity lookalikes and like novelty acts for both uh, corporate and private. We have a variety of different acts. She can send Leonardo DiCaprio, Tom Cruise to your house. She can send showgirls. I'm one of her main guys, and I love working for her. Are you a celebrity lookalike? Or oh, I don't know. Yeah, Brad Pitt. Well, can't you say? I it? don't know the way you said it, but <laughs> but you were telling me earlier about the, the paparazzi, and uh... we have a paparazzi crew, <laughs> right? And there's a, a lot of improv involved in that. If you are having a special party, maybe you're a sales force, and you mm -hmm. want to honor your top salespeople, they'll put up a red carpet with some stanchions. And they'll hire a paparazzi crew. We can do vintage. We all have flashing cameras. Mm -hmm. We'll come to your party or event and compliment or haze or entertain, hopefully, the guests as they come through the red carpet. And we, we yell jokes and improv material at them. Yeah, the paparazzi crew, it's, it's a great thing. And do you have any stories about any rappers that may have... Uh... I told you this story. <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. <laughs> I told you. But this I was story. asking as as if you hadn't because <laughs> um, we're just going off the cuff here. <laughs> right. Right. We wink. Do, we, wink. We, I get it. <laughs> we we have shows in Hollywood at the Dolby Theater or whatever right. they're calling it now, and we're working, say, with the Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise and Leonardo DiCaprio, mm -hmm. and and all of her lookalikes are absolutely wonderful, but we're the paparazzi crew. So we're standing there yelling at these people, like we're treating them like, hey, Jack, over here. And he's doing his Nicholson thing. Meanwhile, the tourists are walking by, and they see fake paparazzi, who they don't know are fake, yelling at fake celebrities, who, once again, they don't know. And they're like, oh, my God, we're having a celebrity moment, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the public very often can kind of like get sucked in by this, by this little thing. We had a gig in Santa Monica a long time ago where they hired 25 or 30 people. Right. And it was for a rapper or a music producer's birthday. Right. Surprise gift. And I think it was from his management company. So there's a bunch of us down in Santa Monica. Some are dressed like policemen. Some are dressed like tourists. We're dressed like a news crew. And we get the word, okay, he's here. 
I don't remember who it was, I would tell you, but he's here, he's here. Okay, get ready, everybody. And the guy comes in through the front of the restaurant into the back, which faces a public area right off the promenade. And it's like, oh, look who it is. And we started to make all this, and some girls showed up. I was like a roller skating gorilla with balloons. It was just crazy. And he's like, oh, oh, hell no. He jumps over the fence, and he starts to run down the Santa Monica promenade. Now, his people are going with him. So there's two or three people that are running after him. We look at the client, and she's like, go, go, go. So now this guy has an unintentional accidental parade running through the Santa Monica promenade with about 20 of us behind him. Regular people who were shopping and didn't know any better mm -hmm. started jumping in and the crowd was building as we're all going down. So it's 20 and 30 and 40 and it, it, it got, got crazy. Right. It just got crazy. But that's what can happen with live events. Yeah. That's it. That's awesome. The yeah. life of lemmings. That was it. Yeah. Oh, look, we almost all run. Yeah. We're just going we to don't want to miss behind. on anything. We'd have that out there if we go out on the boulevard again. Oh, my God. We, yeah. Uh, I'm working on this character that he's a janitor, but he drives a street sweeper. <laughs> and Brian's playing my father in the series. And we took the street sweeper out on Hollywood Boulevard. Oh, yeah. To get these shots for this music video intro thing. And it was during COVID, though. So it wasn't really, it wasn't like popping Hollywood Boulevard. Yes. But Doing some of that with a with a paparazzi crew would be still Hollywood be Boulevard. Though. Oh, it yeah. was still oh yeah. A lady pulls up next to us and she says to me, "Are you famous?" And I said, uh, "With your help, ma'am, I'm about to be." <laughs> but the best picture we got from that day, we had some good footage and the video turned out amazing. David edited it. It's a really great video. But the best picture we have is from a a, a fan on the on yeah, the side of the road. He was just a tourist. And he sent him the picture, and it's an unbelievable picture. So, I mean, you never know what's going to happen with people. And there was people running down, chasing us as we, as we went along. We went back and forth. And, you know, it's just one of those stories we pull up. So we're going to be guerrilla filming on Hollywood and Highland. I mean, and he's driving a street sweeper. Loud, diesel-powered. Yeah. Like It's not yeah. a big street sweeper. It's like a little, almost like a zamboni okay. thing. All right. Um, yeah, go ahead. But it's loud, so they pull up at the gas station on Franklin and Highland. And yes. so his buddy Trev got a pickup truck with a trailer, and they got the sweet street sweeper on the trailer, so they, they release it there in the gas station. And I'm taking, what, did I take, I think I took the uh, the Metro out there? Yeah. Dressed like, you know, I'm wearing a, like a trunks and robe, like a boxer. And on the back it says Macho Man. Oh, my. Shout out to Ricardo Molina, the guy who made that for a play we did at least 25 years ago, and I just kept it. I can't tell you how many auditions I've used that on sure. if I was being some sort of uh, deity or something. And, you know, they don't see the back in the commercial audition, you know, for the, you know, and I'm out there. So I go down to, to Hollywood, and we're on the phone, and we're trying to figure it out. We're like, everything's good. Uh, Matty Ice, our... Director. Matt Ralston, our director, is down there, and we're like, yeah, you know, and I see, oh, there's a cop parked here. And he's about to be coming down, and I'm like, oh, shit, oh, shit. So the cop makes a U-turn, and then he comes, he makes a right on Hollywood off of Highland. And the cop, his eyes are like, speaking of Beetlejuice, his eyes are like, boing, yeah. and now it's an O-turn. And he comes up right up on him. And he's like, what the hell are you doing? You know, it's got no license plate. It's got no, yeah. you know. <laughs> this loud machine. <laughs> and I've got to tell you, I, I like to fancy myself as Mr. Cool. And I'm like, oh, shit, this whole thing's going to go. Because we're planning a guerrilla shoot on Hollywood Boulevard. And we've been planning. I go, oh, this shit's going to go sideways. So he just starts talking calm to the cop. The cop's like, he goes, yeah, we're trying to do this for this, for social media. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly what you said, yeah. you may, because he said he didn't know anything about social media. Yeah. And he asked me what, he's like, what well, does this thing get to the gallon? And that's when I knew, like, oh, we're going to be all right here. I'm like, I'm about to find out today. Right. <laughs> and, yeah, he basically gave us the go-ahead. By the way, Franklin and Highland, if you're not in L.A., that's the busiest intersection oh, yeah. in, in yeah. L.A. Yeah. yeah. So you guys put the bar pretty high there. Yeah. And then coming down to make the right. So what he says is, you know, where is this going to be shown? 
And you said, you know, um, Instagram, YouTube. Instagram, yeah. And he goes, oh, I, I don't have any social media. And I'm standing right next to the camera. So David's at the, the curb talking to the cop. And I'm standing next to Matthew with the, with the camera. And he says, I don't have any social media. So I say to the camera, well, then how do you know who hates you? Oh, wow, wow, wow. And then the cop says, how long are you going to be here? And he says, you know, whatever, not very long yeah, or something. 15, and he, the cop says, hurry up and don't get caught. You've been watching Brian Lally, Hollywood native. Now I want to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, and that's teaching acting. So I co-founded Lola's Acting School with my son, Kyle Lally, Lally or Lally Acting School. I've been acting for a, a long time now of 100 plus credits on IMDb, hundreds of plays I've been involved with over the years. And I just want to share that experience with you. What we do differently here at Lola's is we give you practical advice that you can use on a movie set, on a play, an audition, anywhere. We give you the foundation to build yourself as a great actor. If you come to us, you don't know anything. We can teach you everything you need to know to be comfortable on a, on a set and to excel. Don't just listen to me. Look at what our students are doing. Daryl Wesley, who is writing on two hit shows, The Game and The Upshaws, and Ben Barrett, who is a series regular on The Politician. Megan Davis, who is uh, playing Amber Heard in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard story. Come check us out. We're at the Historic Arc Theater in the NoHo Arts District. You ever want to try plant-based eating? I have. What, you're a little confused, overwhelmed, you don't know how to get started? Definitely. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Go to Debbie Chu's Chew On Vegan YouTube channel. Debbie Chu is a plant-based RN. I've known Debbie for over 38 years, and she's very good at what she does. You go to the channel, and there's 300, over 300 recipes. They're simple, easy to make, and they're delicious. If you want to try it, you just might get healthy. Give it a shot. Chew On Vegan. Yeah. Oh, and, and then he takes off my kind of cop yeah, yeah. yeah i like it so we don't know what we're gonna do you know because we're just so i get on the hood of the street sweeper then i'm standing up on it and we're trying to you know we we don't have any music going it's not like a music video and so we don't know uh we're off beat a little bit which may at sometimes not yeah. the whole thing i'm just being real picky now as a as, a, as an actor but so we shot this thing up and down four or five times. Yeah, him giving us the go-ahead completely loosened me up to like, all right, okay. I can. The so cops said now it was I'm weaving okay. back and forth on <laughs> so, Hollywood Boulevard. So we're in between the walkway at the Jimmy Kimmel Theater yes. and Orange Drive, or as my mother would say, Orange Drive. She was from the Bronx. And so in between red lights, we're weaving. He's doing S's. I'm on the hood. <laughs> We're dancing, and it's just nuts. So I'm an older gentleman who's seen some shit in my life. These guys are all kids, right? This is a couple of years ago. David's in 28, Matt's 25, and who else do we have? Taylor out there? Who else was? Uh, our boy Jason. Yeah. Dreads, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we got other people with cameras. And then the director is like, okay, so this time, and I'm like, there is no this time. Yeah. We've gone back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on Hollywood Boulevard. And I go, that next cop, he's coming around. the. It's Hollywood Boulevard. It's the Chinese. He's coming around the corner any second. I'm like, we're loading up and getting the fuck out. And Trev had brought the truck with trailer on Hollywood Boulevard now, and he just drives it up there, and we take off. These guys yeah. think we're going to shoot all day. They think we got a permit. <laughs> and I'm like, no, guys. You know, we're done. We got to and it, and it turned out. Yeah. Um, it turned out really We were good. high off that for like two weeks. Oh, Just yeah. Like crazy yeah. high going on. Yeah, we went to eat over at Okie Dog on Fairfax and <laughs> yep. Willoughby, another legendary spot. We just sat there and just, uh, was, yeah, Jimmy was there that day, the owner, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Jimmy, the owner, I've known him since I was 15 from the original Okie Dog. Danny's Dogs, as us locals call it, on Santa Monica and Gardner and Vista. However, <laughs> Vista changes to Gardner right there. I don't know, but right across from... Astro Burger. So Jimmy's still around, and Jimmy looks like a homeless guy, and he, he owns like $15 million worth of property in Hollywood there. So he comes up, and I'm telling the story. I said, whenever I see Jimmy, I've known him all my life. I said, he gives me, you know, gives me a dollar and says, here's $100, buy a house. And so we pull up, Jimmy's there, and he hands us. He does exactly what yeah. he's been telling <laughs> he's me. Saying, he does yeah. story. Same thing. He's yeah. like, here's $100, buy a house. And Jimmy has his own stories. He was, when he was in Vietnam, 
He's Japanese, but he was in some sort of covert operation in, in Vietnam. And when we were kids, he was like, you know, it was the 70s. The war was still on. But he was here, and he would pull up his shirt. He's like, yeah, I was in an alley. They, they stabbed me in the front and the back. <laughs> He's got these stars. And we're like, what the fuck? But, yeah, Jimmy got busted. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they had to close down the reg original Danny's Dogs on Santa Monica. But um, So enough about us. <laughs> no, and, yeah. So do you have any idea how many commercials you have done? Uh, it would be impossible to say. <laughs> 28 national commercials, about a dozen films. Oh, wow. 28 nationals. Yeah. Something like that. And then a handful of some more, less, less spots than that, smaller. Regionals. Regionals. We don't talk about the regionals. Regionals or industrials. Yeah. As they say. Holding fees and not national All residuals. Stuff. What the hell? We don't bring that <laughs> Yeah, up. those words don't exist anymore. Do you know who Kenny Moscow is? Who? Kenny Moscow. No. He was the commercial guy in like, I guess, 90s, early 2000s, maybe mid-2000s. He did a... Back in the boom. Well, yeah. He was the second milk guy. Sean Whalen was the Aaron Burr got milk guy yeah. and then kenny moscow was the next guy and he got hit by a car he was a jerk and he got hit by a car and then he got he had he went and he had nothing but these huge chocolate chip cookies he's like i'm in heaven i'm in heaven where's the milk there is no milk oh no he's not in heaven i just didn't know if you guys had crossed paths because he'd done quite a you know quite uh, a few commercials those guys you see the same guys at auditions, or you used to before everything became Zoom or self-tape. Right. You would see the same guys, and some of them you would know because they're your, from your agency. Some people you would know because, well, if, if they're looking for a mechanic or a coach and you happen to look like a mechanic or a coach, you're going to see the same guys over and over. Right. Yeah, but I don't and know. And some guys thing. you know because they're jerks. And, yeah. And they're in there trying to throw you off your game in the, uh, in the lobby. That happens. So, yeah, it does happen. But you were talking about, you know, your buddy who had that commercial run for 11 years. I remember Kenny did a Continental Airlines commercial. He went all over. He went to, to Spain uh, for running of the Bulls. They obviously CGI'd the Bulls for him, but he went to that street, you know, we always see where the yeah. running of the Bulls are. But he went all over, and they got that commercial to seven spots. That's what you want. You yeah. want those lifts. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's funny because my son did a dozen commercials, and only a couple of them really ran. Some didn't get much time. I did a commercial in New Orleans in AT&T. It was eight days. I made my health pension off the shoot. Sure. We were getting a scale and a half when New Orleans. It was a real great run. I don't know if you ever worked with Peter Smiley, Smiley Films. No. But it was just great being in New Orleans for eight days. And the ad guys bought me gifts they said well we never bought gifts for talent before and we hung out gave me the number we were on, we were in touch for years on the phone and it never ran once and i and i called him i said what happened he goes it seems they had technology they weren't ready for and it was a great shoot but it never ran once but fred goss when fred was with still with arlene i walked in there one day because he's an old friend of mine from the 80s and I walked in there one day, and he said, hey, I'm putting your commercial on my reel, because he got it for his reel. He said, you want a copy of it? So I got the commercial, which is impossible to get a commercial that never ran. That's true. That's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. Um, the first commercial I ever booked out here was a Super Bowl commercial. We were told it was a Super Bowl commercial for the Transamerica Corporation. Transamerica was a company that at that point owned like Bank of America and Hertz Rent-A-Car, and I think they owned United Artists at the time. It was just one of those big companies right. that, that owned everything. Yeah, they had the big building in San Francisco, right? Is that who I'm thinking Probably. of? Probably. The big, the big I, I don't know what happened yeah. to them, but we filmed the commercial at a movie theater in downtown, and... We were supposed to be watching a movie. There were two couples, and I had this big bucket of popcorn on me, and the guy next to me bumps me. We dumped the popcorn right. all over me, in my face. Right. We did that 38 times. <laughs> I, I had popcorn in places I didn't know I had places, right? right. Oh. And I'm like, all right, I'm feeling really good. I'd just been in L.A. a couple of months. I call up everybody. Listen, watch the Super Bowl, because I'm going to be on it. Yeah. Just wait for this commercial. It's going to be great. Popcorn. 
<laughs> and I'm throwing a party, my apartment, and the Super Bowl comes and goes, no commercial. No commercial, nothing. I'm getting calls, hey, did we miss it? From across the right, country because sure. I've been bragging and crowing yeah. about it. And I found out the Transamerica Corporation had sold a lot of their things like the Friday before. So they just yank all the advertising at the last second. So you, you learn that those commercials, even if you're in the shot, which is what you want to be, mm -hmm. anybody who gets a new commercial, you want to get into that shot and you hope that you survive the edit, then you hope that it just runs forever. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't always. No, it doesn't. So now you got a great voice. Did you do you do voiceover work? When they come along. Right. When they come along. And thank you for saying that. I hear that a lot. But the voiceover market in Los Angeles is very, very tough. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people who are the A V guys, um, who have their own studios and their own talent, right. They're doing voice product right. sending it in mm -hmm. any newscaster you know in town sends their voices in right all the radio guys and where's radio anymore right you know they're looking for work so the talent is a very select group of people yeah i'm with dpn theatrically and commercially mm -hmm. and they're huge voiceover my agent brought me from another agency when they started their on camera years ago I used to be on their call-in list, mm -hmm. and then I went to New York to do the play several years ago, and then I don't go in anymore. I used to go in for old men. They call me in for to do a grandpa and stuff. He's using his real voice now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I look like. <laughs> but I had an ex-girlfriend, a lifelong friend of mine, Barry Edwards, and she used to be a voiceover agent, and she knew one of the, uh, I forget which... Which of the initials he knew at D DPN, but uh, I think they actually called me in to see if they were going to, through her, you know, good friend, through her, they were auditioning me, I guess, but I didn't pass. It's a tough, tough business. It's very locked in yeah. and very locked down, occupied by just a few people. Yeah, and a lot of celebrities are doing it now, which I thought, do they really need, they really need a million dollars a year to... To do well, I'm not going to say the product because I like the celebrities, but I'm thinking they're worth fifty million dollars. And you know, used to be voiceover guys. My oh. my dad was a voice guy. Shatner, yeah, William Shatner. You see him everywhere right. still. What is he like? Ninety one now? Ninety two? I don't know. He doesn't call. He doesn't write anymore. I'm just. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, you guys broke. They up. lock it in and don't yeah. let it go. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't hear about that. That's all right. It's a tough business to get into. I have some friends, uh, former classmates, former students that are that got on the uh, got on the train, and that train don't stop many places. So I have a few friends who do things like looping. And oh my God, I could have got on looping uh, for Family Guy or American Dad. My friend Mike Barker is co-creator of American Dad. I had no idea what it was about. I had two friends that were on it. I don't know. How, I don't know why they got out, because they they say there's people in uh, New York that are on the Loop Group for uh, like um, uh, what do you call it? The big, uh, not CSI. The uh, is that what it's called? The big New York. What am I? What am I? Cold dead. Case? The, the the big cop show that's been running 25 years in New York. With well, Mariska the CSA Hargitay. franchise in every city. You yeah. might be talking about that. Uh, in New York. I'm talking about the one Mariska Hargitay's on and, and Ice T and... Um, right. Um, what is that? We're going to have to cut this out. So there it is. <laughs> is that what it is? CSI New York? Ice T. Yeah. Yeah, I was right. Yeah, we don't have to cut this out. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, CSI... <laughs> New York, anyway, but there's people in the Loop Group that have bought condos in New York City and Manhattan based on their work on those it's shows. Law and Order. Law and Order. Law okay. and Order. Okay. I you was were wrong, wrong with CSI. But how come, <laughs> where was the Mariska Hargitay one? Jane Mansfield. You're going to make him spell Mariska Hargitay? <laughs> well, they just showed, that she was just over here, and then she left me. So, um, there she is. Yeah, yeah, but click on Mariska, see what comes up. Mariska's um, nudes. The next podcast will be the search for Mariska Hargitay. Yeah, Law and Order special. Okay, <laughs> not CSI, so it was Law and Order. What the fuck do I know? But yeah, those looping groups are unbelievably uh, lucrative. 
You know, I mean, these people get in and people don't get out of that well, usually. it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, acting is hard enough. And if you're lucky enough to book a guest star or a commercial, it usually goes like this. I have an audition. Hey, I had a call back. Guess what? I got the job. I'm shooting it tomorrow. How was the shoot? It was great. I'm unemployed. Right. It's it's one job, a couple of days at a time, and you right. work from project to project. Right. If you're lucky enough to be associated with a company that's going to put you to work for years, mm -hmm. doing what everybody else is trying to do one day at a time, right? That's I'd stick around there too. Yeah. yeah. What yeah, what would you say to someone either about to make the jump or already out here just to be able to keep... You mean about keep, coming to Los Angeles? Either coming to L.A. or just to be able, like you staying in the game for so first, long? First thing he'd say is show up on time. Well, <laughs> that well, I might yeah. be the first. The second one would nice. be, um, I understand what that jump is like. I've done it practically everybody else I have. There are certain cities that pull people in. If you wanted to be a country western star, you went to Nashville, right? Yeah. If you wanted to be an astronaut, I guess I suppose you went to Florida at one point. Or if you're an auto worker, you went to Detroit because that's where it was. Everybody used to come to L.A. because it was the entertainment capital of the world. Everybody loads up their car, kisses their mom goodbye, and, and drives west. And I understand what that is. It wasn't a great idea when I did it. It was very difficult. And I've been very fortunate, but I don't think that that is necessarily a feasible way. If the goal is to keep working and work long term, you have many different choices now. Rather than coming to L.A., you can go to Atlanta. I think you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. You know, that's where everything is. There's a lot of international product. If you're a Canadian, a lot mm -hmm. of stuff going on up there. L.A., is not the central magnetic, you know, North mm -hmm. Star that it used to be. Because now everybody with the advances in technology, you can stay where you're at. Yeah. You can start your own podcast. Mm -hmm. You know, you can animate something. You can do different things. So the advice that I might give to somebody planning to come to L.A., that should not be number one on the list like it used to be. I would say that you need to explore five or six other things, other options and other ways you can practice your craft, mm -hmm. whether it's producing your own content or getting involved with somebody else who does. Because LA is overcrowded. It's incredibly expensive. There's a show business university that is close by where I live. Mm -hmm. And they have a worldwide enrollment of students. There are people there that come from Russia or from Italy, or China, or wherever. They recruit, they bring people over here. People are coming to LA to study because they're in the hub of the entertainment capital. And it just doesn't seem to be the same hub that it was. And I, I worry about people who do that. You mm -hmm. know, I came across the continent. These people are coming from different continents. Yeah. Yeah, so wherever you're at, Make your own opportunities. Associate with people who are doing the same kind of thing. If you're very lucky, you may find your way. You know, that's great. But it's kind of always been like that, that Danny McBride worked on David Gordon Green's student film in college. So in turn, Danny McBride got into Pineapple Express. And there was no reason that Danny McBride should have got in that film with the way films are cast now. You mm -hmm. know, with the stars they had in there, Seth Rogen, James Franco, Gary Cole, who was it, Rosie Perez. They had a lot of they have a lot of big names and then and then Craig Robinson, who was obviously big from the office, and all of a sudden Danny McBride. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did he get in there? We had an association with David Gordon Green. He'd worked mm -hmm. on to help him on a student film in college. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I worked with Danny McBride on uh what did he work on? As I Lay Dying and um Yeah, As I Lay Dying. And I told him, I tell my students about that all the time. He's very nice. He said, oh, well, thank you. Thanks for saying that. I go, yeah, man, you, you helped this guy out. And now he's made $50 million or 100 whatever. He's, you know, he's incredibly successful, along with being a really funny fucking talented guy. Mm -hmm. good, good dude. Yeah, but created he, his own opportunity. Yeah. 
but he's um, there was no reason that he should have been in there. And I tell my students all the time. I mean, as I'm piggybacking on what you said, find like-minded people, grow your group, which is really important. And you can do that anywhere. And you have to start doing something. Seth Rogen came. Uh, I was working. Uh, with James Franco at UCLA, and Seth Rogen came to talk to the class, and he said, you know what, if you come to, up to me and ask me for help, and I say, what have you done, and you say nothing, he said, I don't want to talk to you. you got a phone. You can put a two- or three-minute video. You can do something nowadays. Anybody can do something, and you have to start with doing something. You know. And he said, I'll take a look at it. You know what I mean? So anybody can do something. So I think it's a great idea. Uh, or, no, it's great advice because... People have the ability to do the social media stuff. So uh, that's what we're doing. But he's never going to release anything, ever. <laughs> it's getting there. Yeah, it's getting there. We yeah. started in 1984. <laughs> but, you know, it's almost edited. It's now. coming. It's oh, coming. Okay. So, yeah. But that's the way young people should do it. And coming out here isn't a bad thing, you know. Yeah. Professional. Hey, you're on the podcast right now, two days ahead of time. Oh, I was going to make that inappropriate joke. <laughs> well, how inappropriate? Because you're actually live on the podcast, so. Oh, well, <laughs> I was going to make a monkeypox joke. No. Oh. Making reference to a famous line from a little play called Mixtape. Oh. Oh, that's how, <laughs> that's how AIDS got started? Is that what you're going to say? Don't fuck, don't fuck the monkey. Quit trying to fuck the monkey? That's how AIDS got started? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And I thought of you, my friend. Well, that's because I love you. Well, I'm sitting right next to the seat you're going to be on on Wednesday, so. Okay, well, keep it warm and not moist. <laughs> oh, <All right>. it's moist. <laughs> I'll see you, hopefully I'll see you on Wednesday, man. I'll talk to you later. All right, bye. Bye. That was my line. Swampy my, seat. That was my improv line. Quit trying to stop the monkey. It fucked the monkey. That's the way it's got started. It's out of context now. So, but there was two people in costumes. They were like, um, you know, recruiting people for movies to come into movies. One was wearing a banana. One was wearing an ape outfit. And then they got in a fight. Wow. So, and I was the theater manager. <laughs> so, there you go. Technique wise, are you Meisner based? Or you do you pull from different techniques? Personally, that's a great question. Everybody has their own sort of, you know, approach to it. Um, I sort of baked my own cake with my own ingredients. You know what I mean? I know about Meisner, and I've studied some of that. And For me, what did Spencer Tracy say? Learn your lines and don't bump into the furniture. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's... Let it's the guy in the eye and... Yeah, I'm a big fan of doing what works for you. Mm -hmm. And if you need the structure of Meisner, the, the, the recall, any of that, if that works for you, great. Mm -hmm. Whatever sort of grounds you into what the performance calls for. If it needs to be realistic, be realistic. You know, from 1 to 10, what's the number of realism? Yeah. If you need to be a little more over the top, you know, well, shoot for an 8. You know, mm -hmm. you can always go to a 10, but that's usually too far. So if you just kind of like find the little spots um, mm -hmm. and do what you do, I try to offer people something that's interesting and unique. The last thing, and, and I didn't always do that, and I didn't have as much success. The last thing anybody needs to do if you find yourself in the finals for a nice acting job that you need the last thing you want to do is go in there and give a slightly different interpretation, but it's basically the same as the other 30 people that were just in front of you. Yeah. I believe in doing the appropriate thing, but take a chance. Uh, make yourself stand out. It's, it's a risk anyway, right? Yeah. Definitely. Well, let's, let's get back. Being an acting teacher okay. at Lola's <laughs> Acting School, let's just get back to Spencer Tracy. And something that you touched upon earlier about, I don't think David was here at the time because he was late, but you touched upon <laughs> all the theater you did between your yes. union gigs. Spencer Tracy and those guys did a lot of summer stock. Yeah. So they would go out for months at a time with older actors. I don't believe in the older actors' theories back then, but he did theater upon theater upon theater upon theater where you do different characters and stuff. And he's also Spencer Tracy. 
one of the all-time great actors. One of the greatest scenes in the history of movies to me is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner when he's given the speech about to the kids and how he feels about his wife and Catherine Hepburn's watching and she has tears in her eyes because he's dying. He is really dying in life and he's summing up their life as he's talking and that was his soulmate though he didn't get divorced because he's Catholic but he was banging some chick on the side. <laughs> <laughs> I, st I still love him, but that scene is just an unbelievable when, you know, life meets art, and she's sitting there, and he died before the movie came out. But it's an unbelievable speech he gives, and, uh, but, you know, there's not that many Spencer Tracys. No. But, yes, but he did say, show up, don't bump into the furniture, look the guy in the eye, and, you know, deliver your lines. But he had had quite a bit of experience sure. it's easy for spencer tracy to say yeah that. yeah anyway so now you may be moving on you well, told me because of the nature of the business i just think it's important to hear your feeling of how it can go to your interpretation of what you're going to be doing right well whether you're an actor or an accountant or whatever you do um, nobody really knows the future uh, but we all have to have some kind of plan for me it, I would be just damn lost if I was 20 or 25 years old moving to Los Angeles and trying to start some kind of career here. It's hard enough. Mm -hmm. It really is. People who make that decision are doing it because their passion leads you there. You're an actor, you're a musician, you're a stand-up comedian, you're a doctor. A lot of times that's a vocation. It's not a profession. You're going there because you sort of have to. And for me, I loved, I started same time you did, black and white photos. There was no internet. The agent would take a package of their 10 best guys, send it over with a delivery driver. They'd send it back, phone call. You get the call, you go to the audition in your car. Right. And maybe you're lucky and you come back. So much of that has changed. Now, most of the auditions I get, they're self-tape and all the responsibility falls upon the actor. Mm -hmm. The actor is the lighting guy. The actor is, hey, hold all traffic. Nobody comes in. You're locking down everything. You're the lighting guy. What am I going to wear? You're doing all the other jobs, right? You're not going into a face-to-face -face job interview where you're looking at the casting people across the way. Right. Now you're basically making a tick talk video right for yourself in hope that you're going to get hired and all the the little tricks that you picked up over a 30 or 40 year career can be trumped because the guy has a better camera setup than right. you do yeah so the playing field has changed the way we play the sport has changed my passion for what i do still burns brightly and I would stay here for the rest of my life, just just working and, and fielding those jobs as they come along. But as I said, the city isn't necessarily the hub of everything anymore. Right. And we're also getting older in a business that is not necessarily very kind to older people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're 40 years old, that means you could have a kid that's 20, right? Mm -hmm. So you're a young grandfather. If you're 50 years old, you're a slightly older grandfather. If you get to be 60 or 65, you're the guy that's, you know, you kids get out of my yard. Maybe you're the homeless guy on the corner, right. whatever you're doing, but the opportunities are less. And you, you can just watch 10 minutes of TV and say, okay, how many people am I going to see over 65 here in right. the commercials and what I'm watching? There's just less opportunities. How that affects me, I don't know. I've gone back and started doing a lot more improv and live theater as it loosens up and that comes back. Mm -hmm. I love doing it. I get a real kick out of it. I just want interesting opportunities to stay in front of me. And I want to have unforeseen victories. Right. As long as a few of those are in front of me somewhere, I'll be fine. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Jim Davis, or whatever your AKA may be, because My you're birth, running around. Okay, let me explain this. Thanks. The very last thing we bring up. 
My birth name is Jim Davis, just like my father. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Jim Davises out there. There's From the guy Dallas. Who, there's the guy who draws Garfield. Right. He's a much more famous Jim Davis right. than this one will be. There was also the cowboy actor Jim Davis, mm -hmm. who was on the original cast of Dallas. Right. And he's got stars up and down Hollywood Boulevard. Right. SAG doesn't let you keep identical names for union and payroll purposes. So I chose the name of James Collins or James J. Collins. It was near the front of the alphabet. We knew a family named Collins. So that's the professional name, James Collins. My grandmother's name was Frances Collins. Really? In another world, you might be related to her. Except that it's a fake name I made <laughs> well, up. But yeah, that would In be showbiz, great. you might be related. Now I can it's borrow some money from you. You're a relative. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate okay. That. Thank you, My brother. pleasure. My pleasure.